In this week's news, Boeing Starliner has docked to the ISS with some faults along the way, NASA wants your feedback on the Artemis program and the rollout of SAS, it slipped again. This is tomorrow's Space News. Let's start off with talking about Raptor 2, which has seen another delivery of two engines over the past week. 33 of these will be needed on Super Heavy and it's great to see them arriving rather swiftly to Starbase after testing at McGregor. One of them is SN63 but I can't work out what the other one is as the number was on the other side. Booster 8's transfer tube, also known as the downcomer, has been inserted through the top into the rings and hopefully SpaceX have learnt how to avoid turning this one into a damp paper straw like the transfer tube inside of Booster 7. Speaking of Booster 7, it's still in high bay too. Are SpaceX secretly installing Raptors onto the bottom of this super heavy booster? Let me know what you think in the comments. Here's one of the new nose cones, but the sleek stainless steel design has been covered with Starbrick thermal tiles. Hopefully we'll see it roll out of 10.3 soon. The ground service equipment around the orbital launch pad was seen venting on Friday and Saturday and tests continue to make sure that all the pipes are behaving as expected. This booster quick disconnect cover has also been seen lifted in by Crane. I don't tend to cover deliveries to the tank farm as 99% of the time it's just liquid nitrogen and we've all seen that being delivered before. However, this delivery is of liquid methane, which must mean that SpaceX are looking to perform some Raptor firings at Starbase soon. Booster 7 static fire anyone? Star Factory is, of course, continuing construction quickly as even more siding has been installed with the framework of the building not yet completed. With last week's episode being a couple days late due to me being ill, I actually covered two days extra of Starbase updates, which means this week has two days less of updates, but there is one more thing which caught my eye. This is a mobile office which SpaceX has styled to look like the crew access arm attached to the fixed service structure at LC-39A, which is a very creative way to stylize what is essentially a shipping container on the back of a truck. Starlink is now officially available for moving vehicles, such as RVs, as that's what the new service has been named after. According to SpaceX, it's ideal for customers who are travelling to locations where you don't traditionally get an internet connection or even a phone connection if you're properly going off-grid. Instead of the residential and business services, Starlink for RVs is pay-as-you-go, so you can pay in one-month increments, meaning you only pay for the service when you're travelling, which is useful. You don't want to be paying for a service you're not using for 11 months of the year. However, the big question, can you use this whilst you're moving? Now, officially on the website, it doesn't say you can't use it whilst you're moving. It just says it isn't designed to be used whilst you're moving. So I'm sure plenty of people will be trying that out once they receive their units. A mission two years in the making is finally here as the second commercial crew vehicle has made it to the International Space Station. Say what you will about Starliner's performances in the past, but we're now on track for the first time ever in history that one country has two different crew capable vehicle types operating simultaneously. Launching at 2254 UTC on May 19th from Slick 41 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station, Atlas V AV082 was in its N22 configuration which means that there was no fairing, there were two solid rocket motors and there were two RL-10 engines on the centre upper stage. Having two engines allows Starliner to safely abort at any time in the mission. After the post-launch briefing, we received no word from NASA or Boeing on the status of the vehicle. In fact, they were silent for 17 hours, leading to a lot of speculation on Twitter as to whether or not Starliner was okay. It was okay, but there were definitely some hiccups. During that time period, two of the orbital maneuvering thrusters failed during the orbit insertion burn. The cause of this has been identified as a drop in chamber pressure, according to Boeing, and the other 10 aft thrusters were able to cover for the two which were lost. The other glitch was some dodgy behaviour of a thermal cooling loop which could have been caused by moisture getting into the loop and then freezing up which would have clogged it. Stable temperatures were still able to be maintained however. That wasn't the end of the glitches in the mission though as even during the live broadcast there were problems. On the approach to the ISS two of the reaction control system or RCS thrusters failed but there are plenty of redundant thrusters on the vehicle in the event that this would happen. The cause of these failures is also suspected to be a loss in chamber pressure. There was also a hold at 10 meters to go for Starliner as the docking system at the top of the capsule was being checked over with the docking ring being retracted and re-extended before those responsible on the ground gave the go-ahead. 
Glitches aside, however, the vehicle was still able to successfully and safely dock to the forward docking port on the US Harmony module about an hour later than expected at 0028 UTC on the 21st. This happened right at the end of the day for the space station crew, so they left hatch opening until the following day so the crew could be well rested before touring the interior of the new capsule. There were two passengers on this flight. Firstly, Rosie the Rocketeer made her second trip to space after her flight on OFT-1. Being an anthropomorphic test device, more commonly called a test dummy, she was used to collect data on a humanoid-shaped object. But of course, if Rosie is strapped to her seat, what will we use to identify zero gravity? Screw sensors, that answer came in the form of the Jebediah Kerman plush, the main pilot from the Kerbal Space Program franchise. In my personal save file, Jeb has just returned from a trip to my Kerbin space station, so it's nice to see his enthusiasm in his job already making it up to the ISS. Starliner can't stay docked to the ISS forever though, with the undocking scheduled for 1836 UTC on May 25th, the day after this video's release, and the landing at White Sands Missile Range 4 hours and 10 minutes later, so keep an eye out for the undocking and landing broadcasts from Boeing and NASA. Do you want to have your say in the future of NASA's deep space exploration objectives? Well, now you can, as the agency has launched an online form which anyone can fill out. I believe NASA are only interested in opinions from the US public though, but anyone can fill out the form from anywhere in the world, so there's nothing stopping you if you're not American. There are 50 different objectives listed on the form and in the PDF glossary which NASA also provided and they fall into four different categories which are transportation and habitation objectives, lunar and Martian infrastructure objectives, operations objectives and science objectives. The feedback received is classed as informal as this data gathering opportunity is really just a way that NASA can gauge how the general public feels about these objectives, what they can improve on and what they might have missed. If you decide to leave feedback and NASA particularly like it and you leave your email, then you could have the opportunity to go to a workshop in the summer and discuss your feedback, which is pretty cool. There was also a 35 minute video released with Deputy Administrator Pam Melroy, Director of Space Architecture Spuds Vogel and Associate Administrator for Exploration Systems Development Mission Directorate Jim Free, explaining the entire thing in much greater detail than I can in this news episode and that is also available in the press release linked below. The scheduled date for SLS's roll back to the pad for the second round of wet dress rehearsal attempts is still up in the air for NASA as the estimated date of late May has now been pushed slightly to June. The director of the Kennedy Space Center, Janet Petro, has confirmed that the supply of nitrogen gas from Air Liquide to the KSC has been tested and that the team are feeling confident about rolling out in early June. The exact date hasn't been confirmed for the rollout, but according to NASA Associate Administrator Bob Cabana, the wet dress attempt would be on the 18th to the 20th of June, with rollout about two weeks before that, so expect a rough rollout date of about the 4th of June. The August launch date is still being aimed at with two windows officially being released. Those are July 26th to August 10th, excluding the 1st, 2nd and 6th of August, and August 23rd to September 6th, excluding the 30th of August and the 1st of September. There are plenty of factors which are going into selecting these dates, such as available trajectories to the moon, which will mean that Orion will return to Earth off the coast of California in the daytime, and other missions from the Cape, which have much less flexibility, such as Psyche, which has just received a delay itself. This is something slightly unexpected because as far as we knew Psyche's launch window was only really around August but it seems like the team behind the mission believe that Falcon Heavy will still be capable of sending the satellite to an encounter around the asteroid even in a more inefficient window. If you're worried about my trip to go and see the launch don't worry everything could be rescheduled and we'll be working on that as soon as more solid dates are released. The actual delay is caused by a software problem. There is an issue which is preventing confirmation that the software which controls the spacecraft is functioning as the team had planned, so this is being reviewed and corrected. This pushes the new launch readiness date to September 20th, which is speculated to be right at the back of this year's launch window. Principal investigator of the mission, Lindy Elkins Tanton, isn't saying a lot on Twitter at the moment, and what is tweeted is just as obscure as not being told anything. In response to a question about the launch window, she said it's not yet public and they're working on it. 
Hopefully soon a more firm date can be put into place allowing rescheduling for my trip to go and see this historic mission launch from the Cape. If you want to help out with that campaign so you get exclusive content for tomorrow then head to the link on screen which should also be in the description down below. Sad times aside, let's get into traffic. As we've already covered Starliner, that leaves just one launch for space traffic which was RSW 0406 on a Long March 2C. This mission launched at 10.30 coordinated universal time from launch area 4 at the Zhiquan Satellite Launch Center in China. RSW stands for Integrated Experimental Satellite in Chinese and the program will see test satellites being used to develop a low Earth orbit constellation called Xi Wang. There's only one orbital departure this week, which is Transporter 5 from SpaceX. And here is your space weather with Dr. Tamitha Scove. Space weather this week is leaving us wanting. As we take a look at the Earth-facing disk, it sure looks lively, but believe it or not, all of this activity has not really affected Earth all that much. Now, we do have a coronal hole that's been rotating in through the Earth strike zone. It sent us some fast solar wind over the last day or so, and that has brought us just a tiny bit of activity. We bumped up to active conditions for a very short while, but things are already beginning to wane. And if we take a look at all of the bright regions on the Earth, facing disk, believe it or not, we do have some big flare players. The main player is region 3014. It has been firing off some decent M-class flares, and it actually is an X-flare player, just a tiny bit. But along with region uh, 3011 and 3018 in the south, and also 3019 on the east, these regions have not brought us anything in terms of big solar storm launches. We've gotten a little wispy things to the east and to the west of us, but that's been about it. It. Meanwhile, we also have a crescent shape a coronal hole that's going to be rotating in through the Earth strike zone probably sometime this upcoming week, and that could give us yet another small uh, chance for aurora, but probably not something that's super intense. So we're just going to be taking a look and waiting for solar storms to potentially erupt. We do have uh, several filaments in the south. One actually launched on the 19th, and the other one is in the Earth strike zone right now, and we're watching it very closely because if it were to erupt now, it could lead to an Earth-directed solar storm. So there's a lot of potential on the Earth-facing disk, but not too much happening in terms of Earth impacts as of yet. Now, as we take a look at our far-sighted sun, this is Stereo A, and it's looking at the sun just a little bit from the side. You can see all of these active regions, and sure enough, some of the pops and fizzles from all of the different big flare players. In fact, as we take a look at the east limb in Stereo's view, you can definitely see two big regions that are rotating into view in Stereo, and they are firing some solar storms and possibly some big flares. So we do have potential for more activity uh, rotating into Earth view here over the next few days. For more details on this week's space weather, including how all this activity might affect you, come check out my channel or see me at spaceweatherwoman.com. Next to that subscribe button is a join button, which the following people have pressed. In returns for the contributions of the Escape Velocity, Orbital, Suborbital, and Ground Support citizens, they receive perks such as exclusive Discord channels, seeing scripts as they're being written, and access to the pre- and post-live show hangouts, where we go deep into topics which aren't even related to space. Uh, sometimes they are, but most of the time they're not. If you're interested in that, head to youtube.com forward slash tmro forward slash join, or click the join button below, and help keep station 204 on orbit for as little as one dollar a month. I did mention it earlier and I'll mention it again, if you want to help with the trip to see Psyche in any way, either contributing cash or sharing the campaign, head over to the link and do what you can to help. Everything is greatly appreciated. You can also share tomorrow with your friends and family so we can inspire as many people as possible to get excited about spaceflight. Subscribing ensures you're one of the first people to know when a new video is posted, whether you want to watch them or not subscribing is still a useful feature. Thank you for watching this week's edition of Tomorrow Space News and goodbye.